for giving us your time uh, today okay. and uh, uh, coming uh, agreeing to give this talk <laughs> uh, to share your research findings on the ahom history uh, of assam and uh, the hindu warrior dachi pot form which is the main subject of discussion today uh, so without taking much time uh, anish ji please tell us more about your work on dachi pot would like to hear more on that and also your field research in assam what uh, what initially motivated you to take up the subject and the challenges that you have come across in the process uh, especially considering the fact that uh, you know there is a certain section of jatiyata badis or so called regionalists in assam because i myself from assam so i know how it works and uh, these people who harbor a certain kind of blind uh, irrational hatred towards people who are not from assam and your work on borpukon uh, and the history of the ahom empire is quite well researched so how have you overcome these challenges uh, so uh, we would love to hear more on these aspects from you over to you so invitation uh, so this is the first talk i'm giving related to let's say dent of table Uh, the new avatar of, of Brahmaputra, and I hope uh, the new book is received as well, and with as much love as the original, that is uh, Brahmaputra story of Lakshmi Narayan. It's been now, in fact, almost uh, seven years since that book was launched, and it has been an absolutely fascinating journey. Going back to the start of it, I would say uh, the first inspiration about Lakshmi Narayan came to me when I was in eighth or ninth standard. And I happened to chance upon Amar Chitra Katha on this uh, great persona, and like everybody else, I hardly knew about this person. I picked it up just sort out of curiosity, and then the whole story, the whole bravery, the whole uh, you know legendary stuff that the story is made of uh, really stayed with me for a long, long time after that. In fact, uh, I decided to write about him as the Second book uh, in my writing career. So first I would say I just Hindu question. I decided that this is a topic that is nobody has explored, especially outside of Assam. Hardly anyone knows about it. So I said, why not explore uh, this topic more and get this great persona in front of the people. So that is where the whole uh, work on Lakshmi Narayan or on Brahmaputra started. A little curiosity born out of a, a comic book uh, of Amar Chitra Katha. I read more. The very few books are available actually on him. Whatever is available, uh, which I could purchase over here, which I could order from Guwahati, I did so. After that, I actually went to Guwahati for ten, fifteen days, and I went to all those places that these battles had taken place because Lakshmi Narayan was a senapati or army commander of the Ahoms, and uh, he fought against the Mughals at a very difficult time. First in evicting them in 1667, and again uh, in preventing a recapture of Guwahati under uh, Ram Singh in 1671, which is where your famous battle of Saraiga takes place. So all these places uh, where he plays a pivotal role uh, at Itakuli in Guwahati, or at Saraiga, or at um, various embankments around the Guwahati area. This place actually went to. I saw how the situation would have been back in the 1670s, 1660s, as uh, you know, person trying to face the Mughal army and navy. A very different kind of warfare being fought. It's a riverine battle. The Saraiga battle was fought entirely on the river, and there is no other instance in Indian history of a major battle being fought on the river uh, apart from Saraiga. So then. Also went and saw how this uh, river and navy and how the logistics of this work because to get boats in the river you need docks and those docks are still visible uh, in Guwahati. You can see them right in the center of Guwahati, the place called uh, Doi Pukuri, which means two ponds or two docks, and um, 
there is a big pond called digali pukuri which is right now some recreation center but it is a quite large pond large almost lake which was once connected to the brahmaputra in fact uh, the approximate direction was somewhere under the uh, current high court in guwahati so from that large pond called digali pukuri uh, a canal is linked to the brahmaputra and this is how the boat system was opened so very fascinating to find about these things in agenda and uh, so yes this is how the pukuri took place also went to guwahati university and met people uh, the kind of you know emotion that the average assamese person has to lachit borsutan i think it is matched only by the average uh, maharashtrian emotion for uh, chatrapati shivaji of course history you don't expect everybody to know history very deeply but every uh, assamese person that i met had a very emotional connect with lachit borsutan right from the person i met at the assam bhavan in nayi mumbai who was a caretaker at the place All the rickshawalas in uh, Guwahati, all the museum caretakers, shopkeepers, they all had this admiration for a great person, and I'm just glad that I could let a book about him. So, uh, in the backdrop of the Islamic invasions and the barbarity that is going on all around, especially the destruction of Hindu religious places of worship everywhere, so how would you analyze the character of? Lachit Borpukon, without whom the history of Assam remains incomplete. Somebody who represents the pride of Assam. Uh, okay, so what have you come across in your research about this character uh, and uh, about his uh, about his wars, the wars that he fought against the against the barbaric invaders? So tell us more about that. So Lachit Borpukon actually is one in a very long list of Assamese kings and warriors who fought against invasions. Uh, so one with this slide share. If you can share the slide where I put out the list of uh, you know that is fought. Okay. Sir. Right. So this is uh, the list of invasions. It's a short list of invasions that have taken place on Assam. Uh, Some of them, the first couple of them are actually uh, faced not by the Aum dynasty proper, but by Kamrup or uh, other dynasties. But right from 1228, you find when the Aum dynasty does become powerful in Assam, uh, it faces a number of invasions. And when people talk about having faced 17 or 18 invasions, this is what they are talking about. Uh, these are the invasions that Assam faced over a long period of time, right from 1206 to 1670. You can count maybe in 1570 invasions. 1206, you find uh, Bakhtiar Khilji actually over in Bengal, and uh, Bengal's Hindu uh, kings were restricted to what is today's uh, Bangladesh, uh, southern parts of Bangladesh. And then, of course, this invasion also in- involved going north and ransacking Nalanda. After that, we turn to Assam, but after that. Um, Prime Minister Assam didn't help much because he got severely defeated at that point. And there were a number of invasions mounted. Finally, there was such a long list of defeats that Assam came to be known in Delhi and Agra and all these, you know, Mughal and uh, Sultanate ports as a land of witchcraft where nobody could be conquered. So the we find medi- uh, medieval test textbooks or uh, medieval uh, You know, writing they describe Assam as a land of sorcery and witchcraft because you cannot manage to breach it. They also describe Assam as a kind of you know letter in Arabic letter Aleph where it is separate from the rest of the alphabet. Aleph is just one uh, separate alphabet. So like the letter Aleph, it was separate from the mainland. This is how the Mughal uh, writings are because they couldn't breach this frontier. and uh, so this entire list of um, you know resistance is something that is very uh, you know unique about our history so very few places in the country which has such a long list of there is such a long list of armies or where they could successfully resist invasions this is why the assamese culture and tradition and religion was kept intact when we come to uh, lachit borfukan This was in 1669, and the difference between uh, the previous invasions and Lachit Borfukan is that Lachit Borfukan was trying to regain territory. Now, all of these people earlier to him, of course, very 
unique and something that we should also write about. Hopefully, over a period of time, I can do so. But in the case of Lachey Borfuga, what had happened was that they had actually lost territory. They had lost uh, Guwahati. They had lost uh, territory almost to east of Guwahati. There is a place called Gargao where the capital was established. And there were various reasons for it. This was Meen Jumla who had done all the conquering. So when Lachey Borfuga took over, uh, there were two challenges. One was to get rid of the Mughals from Guwahati. And the second was to prevent the uh, a reconquest of Guwahati by the Mughals, then they uh, would obviously mount a challenge once again. So, the challenges will be faced are many. Uh, one was that there was a lot of infighting which had led to the conquest of New Jumla. Uh, this infighting had to be overcome, we had to inspire people to fight. The uh, Mughals held the advantage of height when it came to the first time they were trying to take all these places back from them. There was always a chance that having try, signed this treaty and having uh, conceded Guwahati to the Mughals and then trying to again trouble them might lead to a greater blowback which will wipe out the Assamese completely. So there was risk in this and uh, it was Lachit Bhaktapan's greatness that he manages to you know, overcome all these challenges. Uh, talking about Mir Jumla, uh, I would also like to put across the question uh, that you know, we often hear uh, about the Ahoms as invaders. Uh, you know, there is a certain section in this country. Uh, they compare them to the Mughals and uh, I have also come across many such people during my research. Uh, so how, how do you think we can bring across this point that uh, the religious beliefs and faith systems which the Ahoms uh, had followed it had a strong resemblance with Sanatana Dharma. And in this context, I would also like to uh, like you to briefly dwell upon the history of the Ahom Empire and uh, the Mughals. Yes, they were invaders. And why this does not hold true for the Ahoms? So the Ahom, as you can see in that talk, uh, you can put the slide for the Ahom dynasty, please, the entire list. So this is the entire Ahom dynasty, and one of the longest running dynasties of India, continuously. Most of the dynasties got extinguished by, uh, you know, various Delhi-based sultanates or the Mughals or the British. But this is a dynasty that lasted 600 years continuously, right from 1228 AD, right up to 200 years, 1826, uh, Purandar Singha. And when Purandar Singha, they tried to come back to power. In 1857, the whole revolt had spread right up to Assam also. Uh, just going through these uh, names, you will find that the uh, there is a Sanskritization, you can say, or a Hinduization of the names as you go through them. So, as you can see, right from number 13 or 14, the names start changing. And while these names were also adopted, they kept their original names. Now, when you come to the Ahoms, they were not invaders in the sense. They were actually migrants uh, from either one of two places. So this is a continuous debate as to where the Ahoms originated from. Um, the Ahoms were either from the Burma region, from the Mung Mao region of Burma, or uh, they were from the Yunnan province of China. So this is still an open debate as to where originally this tribe came from, the Thai homes. Having come across the eastern frontier, uh, they had their own religion called Fralung. Uh, some elements of Fralung are still extant in the Ahom population of uh, Assam today. For example, they bury their dead. There are some Ahoms who still continue to bury their dead in Moidams and uh, some other facets. But then there's a lot of other uh, Hindu, you know, facets and Hindu activities that they have taken up. What the Ahom did was that once they had become rulers of Assam, they did not try to impose their culture on the population. So, rather than trying to change the land which they had now come to rule, the land changed them. They, in fact, contributed more to the population. In fact, they became one with the population. Uh, the kind of thing that the Mughals could never manage. The Mughals stayed aloof and foreign 
for 600 years or for 300 years that they existed right at the time of aurangzeb also we'll find that they had a very strong component of foreign born uh, muslims am i foreign born i mean people from uzbekistan and turkmenistan and iran and all these places uh, also arabs were there with them a large percentage 50 60% of them were constituents of this so you can imagine that a babar who comes in 1526 uh, obviously carries a large number of these nobles with him who are uzbeks and tajiks and people from outside this periphery of the indian subcontinent but five six generations later also we find that uh, the foreign component of the mogal court is still very strong uh, there was constant conflict between one the shia and sunni components in the mogal court iran and turan and there was a constant conflict between the uh, indian muslim component and the foreign muslim component at the mogal court so, right up to the end of the reign they never considered the converts from hinduism to islam as equals hardly anyone became wazir hardly anyone got any position of power and of course they did not contribute anything beneficial towards the land in general uh, that is the hindu majority of india the homs on the other hand led a cultural revival in assam they adopted the custom of the land they promoted the custom of the land somebody like shankar dev would not be successful without the home dynasty and uh, or his uh, teachings were not successful that to it more correctly a large number of temples were built they are dotted all over the assamese landscape and uh, they had to completely culturally joined assam to india it's not uh, where the moguls or the moguls did is that they culturally wherever they were strong culturally that part became different from the rest of india uh, then talk about a person like uh, rudra singh obviously name rudra itself shows uh, so how far down the path of hinduism they had come up they were completely hindu in fact the seal of rudra singha is uh, in sanskrit it's an assamese script but it is entirely in sanskrit and it uses the octagonal shape for its coins he sent his uh, he used to send students to kashi for learning kashi was a great center of learning in those days as you all know so people all over the country used to travel and he also wanted to uh, send assamese to kashi for learning so it joins assam to india in that sense also Uh, he raised an army of sixteen thousand, sorry, some four lakh, to invade Bengal and uh, carry the Assamese frontier to the Ganga River. Is that is what his actual words are? Unfortunately, that plan did not go through, but it shows the true kind of vision that he was having. And this is all happening in the seventeen hundred, seventeen fifteen, seventeen sixteen. So we can definitely say that the Ahoms contributed magnificently towards the uh, cultural rejuvenation of. the north east especially assam the vast majority of temples that you see today in assam are 17th or 18th century renovations done by the ahom dynasty any you should know longer reading temple you talk about the kamakha temple or any one of them even the temple ashokanta and this was all being done without completely foregoing their original religion so they had quite a few elements from their fralung religion which matched with hinduism uh, they followed for instance the or uh, brihaspati chakra your jovian cycle is what you call it in english so is again something common to buddhism and hinduism also has it uh, this brihaspati chakra uh, they have ancestor worship which is very uh, powerful again ancestor worship and uh, the component that is there in hinduism and of uh, the whole of many was such that they could adopt the uh, new religion could so they could you know encourage the worship of various hindu gods so this is where i would say that the homes came and enriched indian civilization and the mughals did not yes true very true and uh, talking about the maa kamakhya shakti peeth you also mentioned about ashwatthama So there are several Hindu religious places of worship in Assam, and you have also covered them as a part of your work, Anish. So in this context, I would like to ask you: How would you connect this? Uh, 
how would you connect this Hindu civilizational heritage of Assam and for that matter the entire Northeast with the off-heard allegation uh, in certain circles that Assam and the entire Northeast was never a part of Bharat Vashti. So what would be your take on this? Over to you. So when you talk about uh, India, obviously you now there is one category we'll talk only about India as a nation state, as in parts of India which are under a common governance. Uh, under that logic, there are many parts of today's India which are never under a common governance. So for example, Deep South was never there. And uh, some parts, the Mughal Empire, for example, which at its greatest extent never included the whole of South India, but didn't include most of Maharashtra also. Of, but there is another way of looking at India, which is more important because political boundaries keep changing. Your religious boundaries, spiritual boundaries, the way uh, India is looked at by the most of its people. You have, and this India, of course, has to be looked at from a religious sense, obviously, because your Hindu uh, Tirtha Shetras and uh, Dotirlings or Shakti Peets. And in that sense, Assam definitely is, has been a part of Bharat also for many, many long years. In that right, in your, uh, I think Vishnu Puran had written that India is basically land between the snowy mountains to the north to the ocean in the south. And once you have taken that definition, it is obvious that Assam is included because there are snowy mountains to the north of Assam, that is Arunachal Pradesh. You find references to Assam in Itihasa, right from Ramayana and Mahabharat. Um, Kalidas mentions Assam as a place from where elephants can be brought. In the Mahabharat, there are references to Assam. Uh, you will find a place called Ashtaklanta. Now, Ashtaklanta means a place, uh, literally translates as the place where horses halted. So it is taken to the place where Sri Krishna's uh, horses were stopped. And where they waited, then uh, Sri Krishna went to uh, fight against uh, Narkasu. Then this Digali uh, Fukuri that I was talking about, the large pond in uh, Guwahati. If you go there, a big board has been put there, and it is a general belief that this pond belonged to Bhagadatta. So Bhagadatta obviously found on Duryodhan's side. And uh, his daughter was married to Duryodhan. So this is obviously another connection to the Mahabharata. Again, uh, the Narkasu story, as I mentioned, there are dice which are called Pandav's dice, which is in uh, Nagaland now. And uh, Manipur also finds a mention in uh, the Mahabharata, I think, in context with Arjun. Then there is the story of um, you know, the whole Sarastamba dynasty releases itself from Narkasur and other kings of. Assam. So right throughout Hindu Itihas, from the time of Rama and Mahabharata, you find that Assam gets a constant mention. Uh, there is a Shakti Peet that is uh, your Makamakya. And uh, this is one of the 51 Shakti Peet. So nobody else claims that that is a false, false Shakti Peet. Uh, the actual Makamakya temple is here. The sanctity of Shakti Peets has been established and it has been considered correct for many, many thousands of years. There is no contesting claims. So, obviously, somebody was thinking on a very grand scale when saying that the Shakti Peets should be here or shouldn't be here. So, that is another way of uh, looking at you know, the cultural connectivity of us with the rest of India. So, in these contexts, definitely, you can say that Assam has always been a part of uh, Bharat was Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, so after discussing about the cultural and civilizational heritage of Kamrup or Pratyotishpur, uh, Assam with reference to the Ashwaklanta Mandir, the Kamakya Shakti uh, I would like to discuss a little bit about politics. And there has been politics going around among a certain lobby, especially with regard to the character of Bagh Hajurika or Ismail Siddhi. So, uh, as somebody who has been researching on the subject since quite a long time now, and uh, some also say that Bhag Hajorika is a concocted character. Uh, this character has been made up uh, you know, to achieve some of their partisan agenda. So, 
what would be your take on this and what have been your findings in your research with respect to this particular character so a uh, bal nagarita is also called ismail siddiqui he is uh, credited with only one event that is uh, dismantling mughal guns at the uh, battle of vitakuli in 1667 so around november 1667 when the assamese uh, homes tried to retake guwahati from the mughals uh, they found that it was difficult to besiege and take the fort uh, vitakuli is essentially what is central guwahati today a uh, very high your deputy commissioner bangalore and uh, sukleshwar temple that area was the fort so we finding it different to scale it because obviously what is it is level has now risen quite a lot but back then it was proper hill separate from the city and to overcome this challenge it was decided by lakshmi borshikan that they should somehow get rid of the guns that the mughals had so this is where the bag hazare ka story comes in he was the person who suggested that we should go up at night uh, out of these cannons so that once that is done they cannot fire in the morning now uh, as far as i'm concerned uh, one thing was that i did not want that story to drift away into a controversy so i kept to the uh, general view that this is a prevalent view that there was a bag hazare ka uh, who did this uh, to speaking uh, i did not find this bag hazare ka's name in the references that i had got now the references i referred to have been written a long time back so, for example the one uh, on the book of the annals times this has been written by uh, bhuyan mr s k bhuyan in 1945 and 1946 uh, again the book called atam burago in annals times has been written by again s k bhuyan uh, again around 1945 or 47 i guess Uh, he doesn't mention this. Uh, there is a three-volume compendium on Assamese history by H. K. Barkujari, and Barkujari sir does not mention him again. So uh, these sources do not mention Bhagat Jaita. So other one in other reading also now he has crept into this. So I am not exactly sure if it exists or not. Third point is that after making such an important contribution at <coughs> It actually he does not figure again in Assamese history, which I find very strange. And lastly, Azarika is not a very senior rank. Um, Azarika basically is a thousand man commander. <coughs> There were people who are holding uh, ranks of three thousand and six thousand also. So as to how much importance will be given to a thousand uh, man commander when you have three thousand and six thousand also with you? I don't know. So I would say let's keep it at that level where the people think we have done it, but uh, quite possible that did not exist. Okay, so basically you are saying that uh, you since you did not want things to get erupted into a controversy, so let's keep it the way it is. But uh, this character of Bag Hazarika ne- did not figure in any of the historical documents in any of the. references and sources that you uh, you took help from during your research right that yes, that's what correct. you want to so make the point none that i could say if someone mm-hmm. can bring me one of the sources where it actually says so i will be very glad right true yeah so but uh, again uh, this is what the general i mean uh, view point is that there was a bag there if i may continue with it because You don't want the storyline of the book to shift from Lachit Borfukan to people discussing about Bhagat Jarika because Bhagat Jarika is a very minor part of the whole story. Mm-hmm. Yes, but if if we have to go by the secondary sources of literature that uh, you have come across and you have also put as references, so there is no mention of this character. There is no mention of Bhagat Jarika. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, I think we need to discuss about this controversy actually more, and the truths should come out. The they have to be there in the public domain. Uh, so even in fact, I went to one of the places where I used to give a talk, and I met a person who said that he was associated with the RSS uh, in Assam for a long time, okay. and even he did say that the Bal Hazarika has been brought about by your uh, leftist lobby in the 70s or 80s. To prop up, you know, one side. So, 
True. Yeah, it is it, when you go there and people basically do believe that there was a bag of Erica. So I kept him in the storyline because primarily because I did not want the whole uh, thing to fo- focus to shift from Lashid Dorfukan. But yes, uh, if we have to go deeply into this, I would definitely like to meet someone who can provide me a proper source saying that bag of Erica existed. True. Uh, we can talk more about this after this uh, discussion. But uh, yes. Uh, this this allegation has been continuously coming up that uh, bag hajorika is a concocted character and this is where they, this is where from uh, this entire controversy comes in actually uh, and as you very rightly mentioned about the leftist lobby so uh, it has been the handiwork of these people most probably but yes we need of course we need more research on this uh, in the coming times uh, so uh, we can discuss uh, a little bit about the battle of horai ghat and the and the battle of jakhuri because these are uh, both these battles are very important uh, historical landmarks in the assamese culture and civilization in the ahom history uh, so i would like you to briefly elaborate on these two important historical events the battle of jakhuri and the battle of horai ghat with reference to lachi bhati right So, uh, Battle of Uttarakhand happens first. I take it first. Uh, Battle of Uttarakhand happens in 1667, and uh, the importance of this is that Uttarakhand fort is guarding Guwahati. It is under Mughal hands, and if they cannot take Uttarakhand, then they cannot take Guwahati. And if they cannot take Guwahati, then the whole plan of evading the Mughals has failed. So, this was his first test. In fact, after becoming Borfu Khan or the army commander, he was an initial. Or uh, before that, he was the head of the bodyguard of the king. Then he became Borfukan, that is the commander of the army. And his first challenge was to evict the Mughals or Mughal Fauzdar from Guwahati and uh, regain that territory back for the Ahoms. Uh, so the challenge lay in surprising the Mughals and uh, not letting them know that an attack will happen because if they knew that the attack is happening, then they would be prepared and that would be the end of it. So. the ahoms were an element of surprise they kept sending so they were actually supposed to send a large amount of money and elephants to the mughals as to some 20 elephants or 30 elephants so what they did was they kept kept on the side of the promise by slowly sending these uh, gold and silver elephants so they were supposed to send the five in the month they would send one or two and then claim that baki team person at a time lag raha hai kind of thing It's very it's raining and it's rushy, so we cannot send five this time. We send two. So that would keep the mobiles off guard, but give the arms time to prepare. And uh, then the siege of Guwahati takes place, where they retake that Guwahati from the mobiles, which is where it is actually an overnight operation. They try winning it for one month or two months, then finally he sends soldiers into the Uh, forts and he disables the cannons. So next morning the fort cannot fight, and that is how Guwahati is retaken uh, by the arms from the Mughals. After uh, 1667, now the challenge is that Aurangzeb is now going to send a much bigger army to retake all this, obviously, because he has. Uh, we have seen the long list of invasions. Uh, Aurangzeb has become successful in taking some part of Assam after 13 or 14 invasions. So obviously, from his point of view, it is a big achievement. And to lose it within four years, obviously, is not something he is going to be happy about. The Assamese or the Homs also know that a large army is going to head this way. And if they cannot defend Guwahati against an invasion, there is no point in this victory. So between 1667 and 1671, there is a uh, effort. It is an effort to build embankments, to build fortifications around Guwahati, because I understand Guwahati is, uh, is lying at the narrowest point on Brahmaputra. It is still very wide, it is still miles wide, but as far as the Brahmaputra is, it is still the narrowest. Point. There are points on the Brahmaputra where the river is four miles wide, and Dutch government says that this is the narrowest point where we can trap their boats and uh, fight them. Then there is a large series of battles which takes place from about 1669 when Ram Singh arrives with Aurangzeb's army and they keep fighting here. There are all kinds of small battles take place, continuous warfare for two years, and 
then we come to battle of sarai ghat the sarai ghat battle happens in 1671 march so there are actually few things which are very unique about this battle one is that it was entirely in the river secondly lachi borfukan was very ill at this point of time uh, he was fallen ill with fever and there was somebody else leading the battle uh, for the first half in march 1671 what uh, ramchand realizes that he can break through uh, the embankment of guwahati he decides that he is going to make a run for it because the whole warfare and trying to conquer the forts on land and then trying to build a chain of uh, forts mughal forts on the land so as to reach the capital of gargaon which is working so now they need to blast through the opening that they have on the river we find that the chief of the army is so he cannot lead personally and he brings large mughal ships to the river he augments his forces so now it becomes a case of just trying to pass gohati and go on ahead and the home with the ships so the entire battle takes place on 22nd or 23rd of march on the river brahmaputra uh, where you have the sarai ghat this today it is essentially about small mobile assamese uh, boats against the large ships of the mughals lachi <coughs> borfukan finds that the large ships of the mughals are having the effect that ramchand desires and the first half of the battle the assamese actually retreat they are retreating away from the battle going back towards gargaon somebody brings this news to lachi borfukan that the army is retreating and he apparently gets very furious at this he comes down from his sick bed and he then rallies his forces again to fight against the mughals so this is also one of the places where lachi borfukan has become a very a popular person a very revered person for the uh, assamese uh, for in general where he gets up from his sick bed and then enters the battle and of course turns the tide and uh, wins it so uh, one is the personal bravery second is the uh, uniqueness of the battle because on a moving river this brahmaputra is not just a water body it's a moving water body so you are actually moving at two or three miles an hour and uh, with that movement you are going to fight the battle the uh, movement of the water creates uh, forces creates challenges that uh, land based army will not face a uh, land based army will not face the risk of being drawn into another ship i mean the uh, army standing next to it uh, there are the kind of challenges that a boat will face of being drawn into another boat or ship bigger boats will run the challenge of having uh, move to go to the bank and then the ground over there the whole uh, battle field was floating and this is something uh, not there in in the history and having faced those challenges managed to overcome those challenges the managed to operate these large mughal boats with on the 16 16 18 guns at a time against assamese uh, and ahom boats which are small in size maybe around five or six guns with them So it's also a battle of how small boats, but more in number, <coughs> manage to overcome these Mughal boats about uh, two or three times their size. So this is what really makes uh, Sarai Ghat unique. Uh, if you have mainly covered so Sarai Ghat, if you are uh, in Guwahati, this is basically a triangle formed between the Kamakya Hill and uh, the Sarai Ghat Bridge on one side and the opposite bank. So it's a little triangle form. which is where the battle takes place it also shows as to the uh, ingenuity of lachi borfukan there is a brahmaputra is basically a river that flows from the east to the west so at the narrowest point the forces of that water increase the mughals are going to find it even more tough to come up upstream and fight the archers on the river uh, the whole idea is to make the river Mughals fight on the river where the Arghums obviously stand a better chance of winning as compared to taking the fight to a land-based fight where the Mughal cavalry and thousands and thousands of soldiers and infantry are going to have an advantage. This is where Bashir Borfukan's acumen and military skills come to the fore, where he chooses the place of battle and makes the enemy come and fight there. Uh, 
where he stands with the bit of advantage in terms of the water flow and in terms of uh, the mughals having to resist it at the same time uh, with the arms uh, flowing with the flow of uh, flow of the water with the uh, direction of the water they are also having challenges of managing their ships properly their vessels properly and again this goes to show the amount of skill they had in managing their uh, the sea boats and keeping it uh, keeping them safely on the water so as to be able to fight properly uh, anyone is interested in reading more about this i have written an article okay uh, so these are very important historical events uh, but unfortunately we haven't been taught about these in our school history textbooks so uh, do you think the current government has done enough to change these things or uh, uh, let me put it this way or what in your opinion the government needs to do more to incorporate stories and events like these uh, in our syllabus uh, most importantly for bringing to light the point for our future generations that it is the hindu civilizational and cultural heritage that connects each and every region of this country from the north to the northeast and without understanding uh, these important historical events and uh, these uh, these warriors like lachit bhai uh, we we cannot make the necessary changes so so what is your opinion on this uh, so the two things one is the textbooks i would say that uh, yes there is still some way to go in actually seeing the textbook change uh, the past eight years i have not seen them change although i can say that uh, there are efforts in direction there have been some committees set up and hopefully in a short while maybe a few years from now we will see the these committees uh, results and actual textbooks secondly when it comes to lachit barfu khan in this context though i would say that the past uh, five or six years or eight years there has been definitely more <coughs> information coming from the government side of uh, more of awareness when i went to guwahati uh, there was a concrete plinth on which the statue of lachit bhai was going to put up and uh, today i am happy to say that that uh, statue the photo of that uh, particular statue is there on the cover of lachit the indomitable apart from this there has been considerable amount of information being shared from various handles belonging to the assamese government So yes, uh, as far as Assam issue is concerned, some effort has been made in this direction in terms of social media and uh, such. When I wrote Brahmaputra, it was difficult to introduce people to Lachit Borfukan without mentioning Chhatrapati Shivaji on the cover of the book. Uh, today, I can happily say that the situation has changed, and there is no need of mentioning another person uh, when talking about Lachit Borfukan. The general awareness has been there that such a great personality uh, did exist, and I'm happy to put my Half percent for my side towards that. So yes, in terms of your non-textbook media, social media, such there has been efforts from the government where they try to promote these historical figures, and hopefully, with the passage of time, we'll do, we will find that the textbooks also get changed, and uh, Lachit Bhai Phule, not just Lachit Bhai Phule, but the whole of uh, Assamese history, which is a very glorious chapter of Indian history, manages to enter textbooks. So, with, of course, the end goal being that uh, India's civilization is basically Hindu civilization, and it should be promoted and should be brought forward to the masses, and people should read about it rather than uh, spend most of their time reading about the Mughal dynasty, for example. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, thank you, Anishji, for enlightening us with all these uh, important facts and the historical events, uh, and also dwelling in detail. Uh, Uh, on your research and the subject matter of your work what on what you have been working since the past several years uh, we can move to the audience now if anyone has any questions okay. any points okay. to raise yeah hello sir it was a great event to hear you and it was quite informative so i have to ask that you mentioned about uh, northeast can you throw some light about tibet also is it somewhere related for indian history Uh, and the area which is uh, mansarovar can you throw some light over that i would like to hear in yes. case if you are so, it is a visit yeah so tibet actually uh, the 
participate today. What is that obviously being a Buddhist majority place? It is especially connected to India. Uh, politically, uh, there is hardly any kingdom which managed to connect a part of India and Tibet. Uh, the Mughals mainly failed, and before that also people failed. The mention of Tibet is presumed to be in the Mahabharat. I think the Asian uh, tribe beginning from um, letter T. Uh, one of the warring tribes on the Kauro side is presumed to be the Tibetans. That is one link. Uh, in the Indian history, actually, we need to look in the 19th century, not, not the 16th century. There was one person called uh, Zoravar Singh Kaluria. He is a Rajput warrior from what is today's Jammu region, part of the Dogra kingdom. And he actually managed to conquer right up to Tibet, that is Western Tibet. His grave actually is in uh, Tibet. And he managed to conquer up to that place, he managed to take a Tibetan, uh, the people he conquered, he managed to get a Tibetan flag from there. And that flag man remains the only uh, flag of Tibetan and Chinese origin that is in the Indian army's custody. So, yes, that is where your link to Tibet does come across in a political sense, uh, where Jorawar Singh managed to get almost up to Lhasa, but he got killed in one of those battles. So, but uh, the Jammu Kashmir, that is undivided Jammu and Kashmir, right from the Nubra Valley to Aksai Chen to Western Tibet, the entire stretch has been brought under Jammu and Kashmir because of Jorawar Singh Kaloria. Uh I have one question, Anishji. I would like to hear your opinion on this. It is not a question, basically. I would like to make this point. Uh, you know, there has been a continuous attempt on the part of a certain lobby to show that Bhagwan Sri Ram uh, was never a part of these regions of the country. I mean, the north. Uh, okay, and the religious practices and belief systems of the people in the Northeast, including Assam, uh, they are not related to Sanatana Dharma as such, but they follow animism, you know, uh, nature worshippers. They are, these tribals are nature worshippers, uh, they are animists, and uh, they have put across these vocabularies in front of us. Uh, but there are evidences, uh, and you have, I think uh, you have also mentioned it somewhere in your book, that uh, before the uh, before going to the battle, before the battle of Paraghat, uh, the people of Assam, the, the warriors, they prayed at the Ma Kamakya Shakti Peet. So, uh, you know, how to counter this this argument that uh, uh, Sri Ram, uh, mainly uh, Bhagwan Sri Ram, because there has been a lot of politics going around Ram, as we all know. So, uh, the people of Northeast never knew about uh, Ram. And uh, they are followers of an animistic form of uh, worship, which is not uh, similar to Hinduism, uh, mainly to show that they are they are a different set of people altogether, and they have no association or relation whatsoever with Sanatana Dharma. So, how to counter this as a researcher? How would you like to address this issue? So, uh, the first thing is that it pays to not identify the Hindu. Because then there are many gifts which the constitution of India will give you. True. So that is in uh, 400 years ago, <coughs> it was better if you identified as Hindu because the king was Hindu and he did so. When you come to animism, again, it is possible for you to follow both, like the Ahoms are doing. Ahom basically have a religion called Fralung, which is very close to your ancestor worship and animism. But they are also following a lot of Hindu practices. And uh, you know, understand that India doesn't, or Hindu civilization doesn't have this distinction that you cannot follow two things at the same time. Uh, this distinction comes from, you know, from there. That if you are following one particular uh, religion, then obviously you cannot be following one more. This distinction doesn't exist in civilization. You can be very well be following half the benefits of Buddhism also. And we are Hindu, we can follow the of animism and we are Hindu. But in India, even if you go to China or Japan, you'll find that people follow Taoism and Shintoism at the same time. Also, 
and buddhism also they follow they for taoism and buddhism this is how the school of thoughts have developed in the east <clears throat> and once you understand that this is how it is that you find you are you are um, ancestor worship you have in your civilization or animism you will have that doesn't take away the fact that at the same time you can also be of sri lanka this uh, differentiation that tum uh, if you are pursuing sairam that means to sit ke sath bhagwan ki puja nahi kar sakte uh, this kind of literal uh, you know view point this kind of view point where uh, everything is in black and white is obviously coming from your uh, leftist thought process where you cannot think in terms of gray so all these asami i mean the uh, right Yes, they do follow customs which are a bit different from the rest of the country. But again, between the rest of the country, also you find that there are customs. You take something like Jagannath Puri, is Jagannath Yatra. That uh, Jagannath idol is supposed to trace itself to a neem tree that is eight thousand years old. Now that memory has been kept alive. Nobody has said that the neem tree got chopped down or destroyed. It was worshipped as Jagannath. By succeeding generations. So now today, if you want to call it an integral, an integral case, this confluence of thought processes, which is there in this generation, will obviously mean that you can just there are animist uh, religions also, and there are people who will follow uh, burying their dead, uh, which is a Aham practice. And at the same time, they can very well be worshippers of uh, you know Sri Ram Sri Krishna. If not for the Assam, I would say Shankara Chari. I mean, Shankar Dev becomes such a huge popular figure. And how did the Vaishnav movement become such a huge success in Assam? If they were so attached to their uh, religion only, so this is something we need to understand. That there, well, first of all, even after being in contact with what we will say uh, mainland India for past thousand, fifteen hundred years, their practices have not disappeared. They continue to have their tribal practices. Other parts of the world where other religions have come, their tribal practices have disappeared completely. In the whole of Europe, you will find maybe three tribes which are still holding on to their original practices and recognizing those practices. As far as India is concerned, I uh, don't think there is any tribe across the entire country which has lost its practices by coming in contact with Hinduism. Uh, so yes, I will conclude by saying that the both things can coexist, and it doesn't make them any less of a Hindu if they are following animism or ancestor worship or whatever. Because Hinduism is not a set of dogmas which need to be followed. Yes, Sunita, good evening. Yes. I would like to draw your yes. attention or any uh, one question is there uh, regarding Sarai Ghat battle. Is there any Muslim error in Sarai Ghat battle? Is there any Muslim warrior in Saragat battle? Is there no. any Muslim warrior in the battle of Saragat? No, not regarding Saragat. I would like to attention you regarding Bazuriga. What is controversy is going on? Number one. Number two. Is there any Muslim office bearer in Ahom Ahom Rajabha? So as I mentioned in the question earlier. Is that the sources that I have read? I have not come across this name of Baba Garika. I have read of uh, Mr. Okay. S.K. Buyan from 1940s. I have read uh, Bapu Jari again from 1960s, I guess, and couple of other sources. So John Bengali author also wrote on Mughal Rajas and the Vasa in the 1920s. These sources that I have read, they don't mention Baba Garika. All the uh, but. If we go to Guwahati, it's a basic very popular thing to say that Bhag Azharika fought for the Assamese at Kutakuli. Uh, so I would say that this is what the popular opinion is. I have not read about it. If somebody comes with me, uh, comes to me and says that this is the proof for Bhag Azharika existing, very good. I like accept it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Second question is there. Is there any Muslim warrior in Sarai Gad? Muslim Potarika. Or Muslim officer, office bearer, Muslim office bearer in Aham Darbar. No, not mentioned. I mean, uh, if he was also he had absolutely uh, no consequence, which like, but I have not seen anyone of them. Then how? Then how? 
Then how the Bhagavadika, uh, name of the Bhagavadika came in the light of Saragat Patel. Yeah. It is miracle. So, Bhagavadika name actually doesn't come to Saragat. Bhagavadika's name comes in 1667 at Battle of Yutakuli, where he uh, recaptures Guwahati. And okay. uh, his name doesn't come again. So, either he died after that, or he didn't exist, one of the two. And I, as I said, my sources, uh, what I have, they don't mention his name. But because he's a very popular character to be mentioned in Assam, I included him in the book. But I am still looking for a proper source where he is specifically mentioned. I found one source, which is basically um, some place called Motijil Avenue. And there's a family member of these people, which I don't know how much to trust because he was a family member. But apart from that, I will not come across this name in history textbooks.